Canadian National, National Film Day. Film. Nope, that's not, it can't, that's not right. Oh, just follow my lead on this one. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. No, no, maybe it's Happy Film Day, film of, day Canada. of Canada. Happy, happy of Film Day of Canada. Actually, it's Happy National Canadian Film Day, okay? The moose is right. It's Happy, happy National, National Canadian, Canadian Film, film day. day. How'd you get in? I don't know. It's hot in here, eh? Hi everyone, my name is Wendy Donnan, and I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Oakville Festivals of Film and Art. We really hope you enjoy the classic comedy meatballs. And whether it was a trip down memory lane for you or the first time you saw it, the film's always fun. And it really suits the National Canadian Film Day theme, Feel Good. And as well, especially now, it's, po it's really wonderful to be able to laugh and enjoy one of the funniest and most popular Canadian films of all time. OFA is honored to be partnering with Real Canada and the National Canadian Film Day to deliver one of the largest virtual film screenings in the country, over 1,000 live community screenings across Canada today. Now, before we head into the much anticipated Q&A with Ivan Reitman, Jack Bloom, and Kate Lynch, I would like to announce that the Oakville Film Festival will be run virtually from June 23rd to 29th and also available across Canada. Over 70 films over seven days, live Q&As provide the magic and give you the chance to interact with filmmakers in real time. And you have seven days to watch everything. Check out OFFA.ca for more details. We begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on Aboriginal land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. As settlers, we are so grateful for the opportunity to meet here and thank the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. Long before today, there have been Aboriginal peoples who have been the stewards of this place. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for being stewards of this traditional land. We also acknowledge the Anishinaabe, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place and the contributions that the Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made both in shaping and strengthening our community and our country. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Valentine, our host for the event. With her great sense of humor and enthusiasm, Jennifer is no stranger to interviewing celebrities. We've all enjoyed her smiling face for over 23 years as the host of Breakfast Television, the Live Eye segment with Global News, Metro Toronto, and The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. She's a celebrity in her own right, and behind the scenes, she's also a digital media producer and content creator who continues to deliver her passion to entertain. Please welcome Jennifer Valentine. Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Jennifer Valentine, and I'm joining you from Real Canada. I'm so excited to be here tonight on National Canadian Film Day and to be able to speak with you and uh, some very special guests from the movie Meatballs. Today is National Canadian Film Day, which means that Canadians from across the country and even around the world are watching Canadian films and celebrating the work of the amazing filmmakers working here. Now, before we get to our Q&A with our special guests, I wanna thank some of our sponsors for tonight's event. Telefilm Canada, Netflix, Bell Media, CBC, and Encore Plus. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our guests for tonight. We'll be joined by actors Kate Lynch, who plays Roxanne, and Jack Bloom, who plays Spaz, and of course, director Ivan Reitman. But, before, but first, we're gonna show you a brief video to introduce our guests. Here you go. Jack Bloom began his professional life as an actor, appearing in dozens of Canadian films and television shows. And with his partner and collaborator, Sharon Corder, went on to write and produce for some of this country's most celebrated dramatic television series. Co-founder of Real Canada and National Canadian Film Day, he is a longtime champion of Canadian cinema. Kate Lynch is an award-winning actress of film, television, and stage, as well as a theater director, teacher, and playwright. 
With more than 65 films and television shows to her credit, she has appeared in such well-loved programs as Anne of Green Gables, Saving Hope, Degrassi The Next Generation, and This Is Wonderland. As a theater director, she has worked with some of this country's most prominent theater companies, including the Shaw Festival, the Blythe Festival, and Théâtre Passe Muraille. Watch for her most recent appearance in the feature film Spinster, opposite Chelsea Peretti. Czechoslovakian-born, Canadian-raised Ivan Reitman played a crucial role in defining big-budget comedy films of the 1980s and 90s. An officer of the Order of Canada, he is the director-producer of over 75 films which have collectively grossed billions at the box office. In 2010, Reitman was nominated for an Oscar for his work as producer on Up in the Air. Reitman and his family have supported Canadian cinema through countless pivotal means, including donating the land that is home to the Tiff Bell Lightbox, now appropriately named Reitman Square. Throughout his illustrious career, Reitman has distinguished himself as a strong supporter of Canadian talent, a master of comedy, and one of the most influential filmmakers of his generation. Oh, it's so exciting to have you here to talk about the movie Meatballs, and it makes me feel like a kid again. I rewatched it uh, again yesterday, and if you were lucky enough to be able to go to camp in the late 70s, early 80s, um, I really think this is what camp is about. Of course, times have changed, and I'm sure movies have changed so much, And uh, but it was really a sign of the times. Now, I'm going to start off with a question for our panelists, but if you have any questions, just please put them into the YouTube chat, and we're going to do our best to answer as many as we can and feel free to include your name because we want to give you a shout out so Ivan of course we're going to start off with you and let's just start off from the beginning uh hello uh, you're coming to us from sunny California yes look I'm feeling bad because I hear here it is April the 21st and you just had two inches of snow there anyway yes. it's pretty good here I was noticing that you have a bit of a tan and I'm a wee bit jealous. <laughs> but yeah, we did have we did have a snow in the springtime, but it melted very, very quickly. So not too bad. Uh, and this makes us all feel better. So what made you decide to make this film? Well, it's my first film, actually. And uh, I, I was working on Animal House and I was I had been hoping to direct that movie and um, I realized uh, that producing wasn't satisfying to me alone, and I needed to find something else uh, to do. And I called up uh, my good friends Dan, Bo uh, Dan Goldberg and Len Bloom and, um, and sort of uh, told them we ought to make a film, and we ought to make it. This was in March, I think, of I can't remember what year, 1987 or something. And I said, let's, let's start making a film this summer. We all went to summer camp, so let's make it about that. And uh, perhaps you can find a camp that we can go to and really shoot while the kids are still there. And it really happened very quickly. And um, and by August the 1st of that year, we were filming up in Halliburton. Yeah, I know it's, it was in Halliburton because when I put it out on social media, I had so many people messaging me saying, oh, that was filmed in Halliburton and I grew up there and it was at a camp called White Pines. That's uh, right. how, did you, how did you film it at White Pines? Was there actual camp going on or was it shut down for you to shoot the movie? Uh, it, was, uh, it was, camp was going on, you know, there's something like 300 campers. We, we happened to go there because I think Dan and... Uh, and Len went there and knew the, knew the owners of the camp and sort of somehow talked them into it. So was this your sort of your camp experience, this movie? <laughs> a little bit. We had all gone to, I went to different summer camps and I had never actually attended White Pine. Um, but it's a very beautiful camp, as you can see in the film. And uh, I think the... It's a compendium of the kinds of things that, and the experiences that we had growing up in summer camps, and uh, we try, and then we try to put a really good story uh, to the whole thing. 
And, and you really did. You put a great story. And it had a little bit of everything. Like, I, I could, going to camp myself and being a camp counselor, I could to- totally relate to so many things, especially the pranks. Yeah, look, there's the pranks. To me, it's it's the spirit of, of the kids when they're in big groups, you know, particularly the the dining hall experience or, or sitting around in large groups around campfire or, or uh, it was competitive and it was really loving uh, amongst all the kids, you know. It's, and, and of course, the, the counselors experience. hooking hooking up, which, well, which I happened. never did, but but other other counselors did, but I, I never did. Good for you. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> I got I to gotta go back in time. Uh, but we have a question from the audience. So for, uh, um, for you, Jack, and for you, Kate, what is it like to watch yourself in the film now? You go, Kate. Dreadful. <laughs> Dreadful. <laughs> Dreadful. I mean, it's thrilling to watch the film, but, you know, it was, I think, was it not actually, was it 1979, Ivan? We shot it in 1978, and it was released in 79. Yeah. So, Thank you. So, you know, a few years ago. But it was really fun watching those clips, because it's so hackneyed, the cliche, but we were so young. We you were. You were, you were a baby. Were you 17, 18? <laughs> well, no. <laughs> Thank you. I was a little older than that. But uh, I think I was 28 or 9 or something like that. But oh, okay. Really, it okay. is a long time ago. But it was a lot of our first film, and and for that reason, shooting felt like summer camp. We were staying in a lodge. the 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 company sort of took over this lodge, and um, there was much uh, as many pranks and hijinks and craziness going on at the end of the day after the shoot as there uh, were in front of the camera. We there were all night poker games. There were all kinds of things. I remember grabbing a canoe in the middle of the night and getting out on the water with one of my um, uh, cast members, I will say, uh, at least more more than, more than once. There there was a lot of fun that happened. Uh, Jack, you played such a great nerd. Um, so where did, much. <laughs> where did you get your inspiration? I can tell you precisely where I got it, because uh, some of you may know I was also the casting director, and we were having a lot of trouble finding Spaz. And at one point, Dan Goldberg and I came to Ivan. You may remember this, Ivan, and said, we have the guy. We've got the guy. He gave a fantastic audition. You have to see him. And you looked at the picture and you said, no, 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 that's not the guy. And we say, you got to read him. you got to read him. And uh, you agreed. And he came in, did a very funny audition. Dan and I were killing ourselves. He left and you said, no, no, he's not the guy. He's way too good looking. <laughs> and then you turned to me and said, do you want to read for it? <laughs> And uh, and I did, and that that's and I just did exactly what that other guy had done. Honestly, it's the truth, and uh, and it worked out. So thank you for that, Ivan. I think the key to the character, though, was always always the glasses with the tape holding them together. And but that happened on the set. Do you remember that happened like two no. seconds before you rolled camera for the first what? shot of the movie? Yes, it was. You, you said, wait a minute, wait a minute, get some tape, put some tape on the glasses. Honestly, it came out just like that from you, otherwise it wouldn't have happened. And similarly, Perfect. when we were filming The Father on Family Day, two seconds before, you said, put tape on his glasses too. <laughs> you so were you rocking mentioned it. That, you, said you, you mentioned that you um, were involved with the casting. And uh, and a, a lot of people, a lot of Canadians in meatballs. So you had an open casting call, and you were surprised how many people actually came out to be uh, an extra or in the movie somehow. Well, we saw 1,100 young people in in three days, and then uh, showed them to. I think we picked like 80. Ivan, you called back about 80 of them, and you saw them in groups of nine or 10, and you had them improvise, and you had them do stuff, and you threw stuff at them. And out of that 80, you ended up casting like eight that actually ended up in the movie. Yeah, they, they were mostly the the older kids, right, as I remember? Correct, yeah. 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 And the, the other camp, the, the kids in the rich kids uh, camp. Um, we were lucky because camp was going on, and I was casting, you know, I would, I would see a bunch of kids or a couple of kids from the, you know, just doing their normal camping stuff. And I said, look, can you be in our film for a day? And, uh, you know, they thought that was a great thing to be in a movie. 
but then after about an hour of hanging around doing the same thing and waiting most of the time, they thought it was better to just go to camp. It was a little harder to get it. went to large groups, but it worked out. They're proud when they oh. finally saw it. Can I say something about though. one of those yeah. experts? Um, years, years, years later, Sharon and I are writing and producing television. We were, uh, were coming up with a show called Traders, and the writer we were working with was David Shore. And David Shore, Ivan, was in Meatballs as an extra. He's, uh, you can see him behind, uh, behind Brenda when Brenda's trying to get Crockett to dance with her. David Shore, as a very young man, as a camper, is in the background. Hi, David. <laughs> Wherever you are. <clears throat> Uh, Ivan, I want to know, how, how did you know Bill Murray? Well, I, I, was, I was very fortunate because um, before Animal House, uh, I was asked to produce a show in New York. I mean, I actually called up the National Lampoon magazine, and, uh, and I had done a, a show with the great Canadian Doug uh, Henning, the magician. We went, we went to McMaster together, like many of the people who were part of this movie. And... Uh, uh, as a result, it ended up on Broadway and it became quite a hit. It was really the first success that I had. And using that, I called up the National Lampoon magazine. I just saw who the publisher was and just called them, cold called them. And uh, I said, look, I, I'm doing this show on Broadway and I'd like to make a movie because that's what I really want to do. <laughs> and, uh, and would you be interested? And he called me in because he had seen the show and was he said look everybody's calling me about movies but would you like to produce this show um because they had a show called the national lampoons radio hour that had all the stars that you come to know um, as a result of Saturday Night Live but this is many many years beforehand and in the show that I ended up producing were uh, Gilder Adner and John Belushi and uh Bill Murray Brian Doyle Murray and Harold Ramis. So I got to know this extraordinary group of uh, comedians, actors, um, and improvisers of an extraordinary, with extraordinary abilities. And I, um, I got to know Bill through that. Uh, Lorne Michaels came along and hired most of our cast for Saturday Night Live, that <laughs> very first company. And yeah. fortunately, fortunately for me, um, you know, Bill Murray had not been cast for that. And um, I called him up and then I kept calling him up. Uh, he was playing baseball, I think, in the summer and thinking that he was going to join the second year of Saturday Night Live. And wow. it's almost a famous story how hard it was to get him to commit to this movie, even though he was only playing baseball. And um, he, he actually committed to doing the movie the day before we started shooting. And I think he ended up coming up to Halliburton by the second day, is when I remember wow. he arrived. And thank God he did. And it really made a big difference. Good score. Um, Kate, uh, working with Bill, were you nervous at all? I thought, I thought you were a lot younger in that movie. I think it's because you have such a youthful appearance. You look so young. Um, but were you nervous working with Bill Murray? Yeah, I was tremendously nervous. But he just kept you laughing all the time. So it... it you know, the nerves went away pretty fast. And he likes to, you don't know what's going to come next. And I really like working that way. So yeah, that was great. Very spontaneous. Very spontaneous. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Yay, me and my fam watch meatballs every year at the beginning of the summer. Can you tell us about uh, the best unfilmed pranks or hijinks that went on behind the scenes? So not, not from the movie, things that we might not have seen. Over to you. I don't remember everything. <laughs> Jack, you remember everything. <laughs> you go. I, 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 Ivan, I, this might be painful for you, but I remember the day the crew threw you into the water. Okay. Well, that wasn't painful. <laughs> that was just wet. <laughs> it was falling. Well, well, um, yeah, no, we were, we were just running. We went out, a few of us went out with Bill, drove to his cabin. He was in his own cottage down the road and it was Keith Knight, the late Keith Knight, Oliver Shalom, and uh, a couple of the gals and we were having a late night party and it was it was very late. Got to his place. He said, we'll take the boat out. We all got in the boat and I, I swear Keith got in the boat 
big fella. We, there were already five of us. I think the boat was designed for two. And we pushed out, and the boat sank like a stone. And we all went straight into the water. Um, so, you know, adventures like that. And then we were up at six in the morning for whatever the call was. But uh, as I say, awfully good fun. Uh, did it take the whole summer to film? How long were you there? We were there. Well, we got we got there, uh, I think, the last week of July uh, for prep. Uh, prep and uh, we started shooting, I think, um, August the 3rd, if I remember correctly. I remember it because I think we started shooting about three days before Animal House opened. And, um, uh, and it sort of set this real, um, it set a goal for me in terms of trying to um, try to get up to that uh, stature as, a, as an excellent comedy movie. Um, we shot for um, until almost the beginning of October. I mean, the, the campers had long left and uh, we stayed there for about a month, I guess. No, it couldn't have been that long because, as I remember, we only had 30, 31 days of filming to do. Wow. Not very long. No. And uh, it, we have it, another... Oh, sorry. It made Go. me very nervous. I think, I think most of the cast at that time thought, boy, this guy's really nervous <laughs> because it was really my first... I had done a small film before that, but it was really my first film with a crew. And um, it... Um, and there's literally hundreds of people in every shot. And um, it, it took me a while to sort of get the rhythm of it. And uh, I just had to learn. And I mean, at some point, Bill Murray put his arm around me and he said, you know, you should relax a little bit. It's going pretty good. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was right. And it was a very, it, it was a wonderful thing that he did to me. But let, I'll tell you, uh, Ivan, you, you might not remember, but you were actually looser than you know, because you were saying stuff like, uh, let's, do a, let's do a scene on the tennis court. Can you guys come up with a scene on the tennis court? And we would run off and write something and you would shoot it. And that happened more than once in the course of the show. You were really just picking stuff up and making use of the energy of the cast. I thought it was pretty impressive. Also, Ivan, I'm gonna weigh in and say that with all due respect for Animal House, I think you made a better movie because your movie has a lot of heart. You know, you really let meatballs have a huge amount of heart. And yeah, I, I, what I think it was thanks to the scripts that were, that were written and the people. And it's finally, I, I mean, I, I, it came, I mean, I learned that the, the key to the movie was really the relationship between Bill Murray and uh, Chris Makepeace, the, the young campy, uh, who was sort of just showed up and they befriended each other. And that yeah. brought a lot of emotion to the story and, and balanced the, you know, the, the silliness and the pranks and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, we had much like animal house uh, where, you know, most, we had all gone to university, whether we were in a fraternity or not, we had a sense of what that was like. Um, and, all of us who had, who had written on this movie on meatballs had really attended summer camp for many, many years, had loved it and tried to distill those really wonderful personal experiences into a film that people could think, remember back their own. Yeah. Um, you know, I love to hear that you thought, hey, let's do a scene on the tennis court. Was there a lot of that, um, just being spontaneous and improvising throughout the film because you had such a short time period to get it finished in? Yes, there was a lot of improvisation, particularly within the scenes that were all written out. Um, I remember Bill Murray um, calling me up the day before the sort of, it's it just doesn't matter scene. And uh, he wrote that speech out and, I just decided to cover it with three cameras, which was a lot for us. We almost okay. never did that because we only really had two cameramen. And um, <laughs> we, uh, and I just, and I didn't tell the, the camp, you know, everybody that, we had the whole camp really, there was about 300 people in that shot. And uh, I just said, just do it, let's go. And we'll record uh, you and, and record you with the people. and. And the reactions were very spontaneous, you know, and it, and it really did work. Um, except for the fact that he blew his voice, Bill did, on his 
the very first take because he was so charged up and he had written this stuff and it was kind of goofy and funny um, and effective. Um, and I think he got carried away by this live audience, um, the campers, you know, reacting to it. I remember well that you didn't no, none of us knew what was going to happen. We were all saying, what was this? Who knows? There were rumors. Nobody knew. And you, you got us in there and you put Bill in front of us. And uh, it really was fun. <laughs> it was a ballsy thing to do, right? It was cool. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. And, I just, uh, and we just covered by just changing, kept doing it. And I just kept moving the cameras on different people to get a fresh, you know, coverage on everybody as quickly as I could. Almost like learning as you're going. <laughs> it was your, your, your early years. For, it was for everybody and it was for me. Um, I'm really happy that it worked out as well. I mean, uh, I, the, having Bill Murray was like having this remarkable engine, um, you know, at, at the head of the car a little bit. And um, he's just sort of such a brilliant comedian and such a brilliant writer and performer that he just had, had this wonderful top spin on all these lines that sort of made stuff come alive. Um, and I, I learned very quickly that I had to be nimble on this movie and it helped me for my whole career. I mean, yes, I, mean, I learned how to do improv more by virtue of sort of producing the National Lampoon Show and watching firsthand these remarkable, that remarkable cast that could just do anything and and really capture an audience remarkably and and uh, I felt we should do some of that in the film uh, to make it come alive. Uh, but most of all, you know, I had a secret weapon. I really had Bill. It was thank God. Yeah, amazing, and and, and everyone an amazing cast. Um, I'm loving the so questions also, from the say, audience. Sorry, Jennifer. Yeah? Bill was also go, go. generous with us as young performers and we would be trying to write a scene and he spent time with us and to say, no, like you've got to get really physical. And he would really gave, give us a lot of tips about how to turn it into stuff. So um, we were grateful to him for that too. Oh, I love, I love hearing that. Um, question from the audience. Uh, how many takes uh, did you need to do the cup scene? <laughs> faz, faz, faz. <laughs> I, I don't think there were very many. There weren't very many takes of anything. We were moving no. pretty fast. <laughs> you didn't have time. <laughs> I think the cup scene was done in about no more than three takes. Yeah, it was pretty fast. It was all a continued shot. And th That's those up. were the days of all the action, all of those sequences of all the contests and the races and the wrestling. And you were, We had to get so much done in like, I don't know how many days or was, but there was no time for mistakes. It was just <laughs> move on. Um, okay, another question from the audience. Uh, this one's for Ivan. Tell us about McMaster and the writers. Well, um, uh, Dan Goldberg and I became really good friends, I think, about the second or third year of McMaster. Um, I got to, I think I directed Little Abner. And uh, on Little Abner, uh, he played the Lonesome Polecat, who starts the show. And Doug Henning, I think, uh, was one of the cast members. Dan's best friend was Len Bloom in, in Hamilton. I wasn't from Hamilton. I grew up in Toronto. But, um, you know, I stayed in a crappy apartment downtown Hamilton. And I was in the music department there and wanted to do something uh, musical. So uh, I just picked that show. And But we also mm -hmm. made films. Uh, at McMaster, we did a movie called Orientation, uh, which became quite a well-known short in Canada. We won a bunch of awards, and it was about the first couple of days of a freshman university student that actually at McMaster. And um, Dan Goldberg was the star of that. And so we bonded. I, I remember I used to stay over in his basement as often as I did in my own apartment because his parents lived really close to the university. Um, I'm loving these audience questions. Um, uh, this one, Kate, <laughs> this is good. Where do you think your character, Roxanne, would be right now? <laughs> would she still be living with Bill Murray? <laughs> Whoa, there's a question and a half. 
Um, yeah, but I think she she went into okay. What line of work did she? Because of her relationship with the uh, Bill, she went into um, lion taming as a career. <laughs> okay, she was well prepared. For that. Uh, I love this question too, because I would never think of asking this. But you know, if you're especially if you're from Halliburton or cottage country, uh, what were the black fi flies and mosquitoes like during the shoot? Oh no, it was too late for them. It was late in the summer. Oh, was it? Uh, okay, got, good. Got yeah, that's yeah. that's Michael from Whitby. He wanted to know. He wanted but, to know if you, Michael, this. <laughs> he got bit. <laughs> but but tell Michael this. You yeah. don't go in any lake in Ontario after September first. It's mighty cold in that water. So we didn't have the black flies, but we had some cold swimming water. It would have been a polar bear dip for sure. Okay, so I've heard there is, uh, oh, okay, another question, um, reshoots. Uh, so we've heard that there were reshoots after everything was finished. You actually had to go back up and, and reshoot some stuff. Well, we didn't go back up. Um, no. I think um, what, you know, uh, I was cutting the movie in Montreal because my my partners um, were there and I became part of that company for a while. And um, uh, we cut the movie together. It seemed pretty good. Uh, the film was as yet unsold. And I, I decided I would take it down to here, down to Hollywood, <laughs> to see if we could sell it. And... Uh, I went to the very first screening. I snuck in the back of the distribution people, and I could tell right away because I had never screened the movie for others except for myself. I thought it wasn't very good, and it wasn't very good. They did. They turned it down, and I thought, "Oh my God, this all." It was way too long for what it was. It was at that time about a hundred, hundred five minutes, and that's where I really focused on where the a film should be and I stopped yeah. the screen I mean I got turned down by that place and um, I decided not to show it anymore and took it back to Montreal and um, and within I think 24 hours back to Montreal in the editing room I cut about a half hour out of the movie wow. and um, wow. and it was down to about 75 minutes and then I remember calling the writers and saying okay, we need to do four or five scenes. And we didn't have any money. I mean, we, the film was privately financed. And we'd already spent our money. But we decided that we would shoot some scenes. And it would, what having screened it for even just an audience of three or four men, um, I could tell where the story had to be. And it's what I was saying earlier, which is the relationship between... Uh, uh, Tripper, Bill Murray's character, and uh, Chris Makepeace. And uh, we, um, we built a, the set, which is Tripper's cabin, and shot about four scenes in one day. And we needed to, sh we needed to show the young guy, the Makepeace character, trying to run away from camp because he was humiliated as a result of, you know, the kids making fun of him in the soccer game or whatever, and um, and just just those five scenes and a couple of new voiceover lines and just cutting the stuff that didn't come up to snuff out of the film was an extraordinary lesson for me, which I used you know ever since. And um, I um, we said we decided that we would try to sell it again and. Uh, we had we set up a screening at the Plitz Century Plaza, which is a large theater, no longer exists in Century City in in California. And uh, a studio actually bought an ad for us to to, to get the right to be the first uh, the first uh, negotiations if they liked the movie. And the place was packed. It was the same ad that you learned to love, <laughs> with the sort of drawings of all the cast members. Um, and and we had about five offers for the movie after the after the screening. It was it was just transformed from that moment. The audience yeah, applauding all the time through, and it's terrific.
That is so interesting to hear about those reshoots, something that we didn't know. Very interesting. Um, and, and something, again, that you said that you've, you've applied and learned from and, you know, applied it uh, to everything else that you've worked on. Um, another but question. I was going to say, oh. comedy is really difficult. And, 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 you know, you never quite know what you have until you put it in front of an audience. And in films, um, you have to get the movie finished before you put it in front of an audience. And then you have to, you have to be um, strong enough to realize, okay, here's how we're going to, this didn't work, this didn't work. And I just got into this whole thing with, with the group that I ended up working with for about 40 years, uh, where we would have these wonderful dinner meetings after the screening and immediately start talking about what worked, what didn't work, how to, how to change it. And, and to be really careful with what we were taking out and what we thought we might try to put in. And uh, not to feel that there's a failure because things don't quite work yet. That it, it takes time. Yeah, well, you talk about what works and what doesn't work. It's like comedians who um, have their routine and they just show up unexpectedly. I know, I know Jerry Seinfeld does at Gotham in New York. Um, on a night, Tuesday night, he'll just show up and say, I want to try new material because he wants to know what it's going to be like before he takes it on the roll. Same, same with Saturday Night Live. That's why they have the rehearsal. I, I got a chance to see it <laughs> when I was in New York right before the pandemic. It was a dream come true. And, uh, and they have that rehearsal. So they know, is it going to work with the audience? So I, I guess that works with so many different things in life where you, you want to test it out. Well, especially a comedy because you know, nobody's laughing. <laughs> You're well, in trouble. It's very, it's very straightforward if people are not being affected by it. And you can feel, by the way, I think I've since tested more dramatic films. And it's not about the laughter. It's about the energy in the room. And yeah. you don't need even a huge crowd. It's, I've now found that just watching it with two or three strangers really rejuvenates my own opinion of what's there, both good and bad, and what doesn't work suddenly become really obvious. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk about your favorite meatballs moment. All of you. What's your hmm. favorite meatballs moment? I know there's probably many, but what's your absolute favorite? What comes to mind? Well, I'll tell you mine. I actually adore the scene between Jack and Keith in the tent. You know, <laughs> how far did you get with the, the big bin of, of candy? I love that scene and it, it seems to me a perfect kind of meatball scene because it's really funny and it's really about relationship and it really has a lot of heart so that's my favorite love it you took my answer kate but oh. <laughs> slightly different reasons just because again we were young and it was our first film and that was the first night shoot at a certain point we'd been doing all these daytime stuff and it's okay we're gonna go to nights and when you shoot at night in a movie on location, it's this world that no one else is in. It's just in this bubble of, of lights and a crew around, and it's you guys, me and Keith in the in the thing. And I just remember that fantastic feeling of, of a little bit of magic that we were creating um, in the middle of the night with no one else around, and it was really, really, really fun. And we shot the scene around the campfire with... Uh, the, Bill Murray telling that story. I just that it, it became another level of fun that I hadn't experienced, and and I, one that didn't get into the movie, and I'll, I'll uh, always be sad about was one where Keith and I were sneaking up. You remember that he uh, gets trapped under the cabin. They take his pants and put them on the flagpole. Well, I've been shot a very long prologue to that scene where the two of us were creeping up and running and being sort of super spies. And at a certain point, I would hit Keith and go flying about 30 feet in the air and, you know, land. And I, I was so proud that I could do that. <laughs> but it never ended up in the movie. It was part of that 30 minutes I was just telling you about. That's right. It was 15 of them. <laughs> the, um, I, I have a few, I have a couple of favorites. I mean, uh, I have to say, Kate, I love your scene with um, with Bill when he's when you're wrestling, and and I love the choreography of that scene and him grabbing you and spanking you or biting you, and I can't even remember what what happened, but 
it seemed, and it, it's something I just sort of learned. I worked with Bill about five times now, six times. And, um, and he's really wonderful when he likes the actress that he's working with and feels comfortable as he certainly did with you. Um, it, um, he gets very physical and, and the physical just sort of enhances the humor of, of that scene. And so for me, that was one of the things that I just really enjoyed going over and over and sort of uh, working on in editing. And the other one was really the set, these things that we did, all did in one day and it ended up being about 10 or 12 minutes in, of the movie were, were the scenes with Chris Makepeace and Bill in the cabin. And it was, in, it was much calmer because even though we had to sh shoot a lot, it was only the two of them on a set. And um, I love the card game scene for the peanuts. And uh, that was written and improvised. And um, I thought it was very important to the story. And I just love the feeling between the two of them and the way they related to each other. Um, I got to bring up the song. Um, where, do, where did that song come from? Was that song, uh, w was it already a camp song that you took and put in meatballs and it's, it's played throughout? Are you ready for the summer? Are you ready for the sunshine? Oh, you yeah. good, <laughs> that was the great Elmer Bernstein. You know, um, uh, Elmer Bernstein, one of the finest composers in the history of, of movies. And um, uh, he, he, he knew John Landis, who directed Animal House. And so I got to meet him um, uh, on that film and I became good friends with him. And um, I went to visit him right here in Montecito. That's why we li live here right now is thanks to him. And... Um, um, and I just called him up. I said, look, I just did this small independent movie. I can't pay you. Uh, we're going to give you a piece of the movie somehow. <laughs> we did. And, um, and he just, he took it really seriously. And he wrote these beautiful songs. Um, Are You Ready for the Summer is the, is the best remembered because we, he actually got a children's chorus here in Toronto and recorded it um, in a studio in Toronto. Uh, to the track that I think he did in Toronto as well. I can't remember now because some of it was done elsewhere. And um, so that's well known. But the song that gets me is when the, when the CITs are coming back from their camping trip and um, it's this lovely uh, romantic song that plays. I, well, yeah. Well, yeah, it is. It's it's a beautiful song, the the one that that you're talking about, and um and so he wrote that one as well. Yeah, he wrote all of them with um. I'm try, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember the lyricist, the very famous. Uh, he wrote "Killing Me Softly." Um, he lives here in this town as well, or did. He's now passed away as well. Um, hmm. uh, but um, I'm sorry, my. My so it'll come to you when we're when we're off. That's, that's when you'll remember who it was. What's that? We have IMDb now. It's it's <laughs> we need to remember these things. Get someone in the audience to Google that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please. <laughs> um, but no, I, I was trying to find the music because I was trying to promote tonight, and I wanted to play that song, and um, I found a version that Lisa Loeb had done, and really? and. It, yeah, it was really nice. I used that one because I couldn't find the kids one. So, uh, but no, it's such a catchy tune, and it's so great how it's kind of played throughout the movie, even just the instrumental part. And yeah. you re when you hear that, you automatically remember the movie. So it's great. Um, I, I want to. We had an audience question, and and you guys already answered it, but they they. Um, they were talking about how they watched the movie Meatballs every single year at the beginning of the summer. I love hearing that. Why do you think Meatballs has become such a classic that people keep coming back to it? Well, I, I, I would like to think that, uh, you know, it touches an experience that, that, they pro that probably touches their own lives. And, um, and there's something about even it's it's not about families, but it's a, about a family of friends that going to camp and it's a it's an experience that many people have gone through, 
and um, mm-hmm. it's I think it's and it was there's not been that many camp movies and it, most of the camp movies are all unfortunately are only about sex and uh, this one really touched <laughs> a lot of different things um, it was, and it was a movie that you could watch with your kids if you're a parent and vice versa and not be yeah. Uh, embarrassed and have a good time at. It was also a great date movie. I can't tell you the number of people who have said to me, uh, oh, my wife and I w- went on our first date and we watched Meatballs. <laughs> it was a really oh, good I date love- movie. Oh, I love hearing that. And camp is such a special place. And that's why I said, if you're fortunate enough to have gone to camp and you see this movie, it brings back all those memories. And even when you're in camp, like you look at the Chris Makepeace's character, um, there's always that kid that didn't want to be at camp, the kid that always wanted to leave. And by the end of the summer or the end of the session, they've fallen in love with camp and they can't wait to go back to camp the next year. And, um, and that's, those are the memories it brought back for me. I was fortunate enough to volunteer at a camp called Camp Uchigayas, and it's a cancer camp for kids here, uh, at like Lake, Lake Rosso in Muskoka. And, um, the kids just love camp so much. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a place where they can go, they can forget about cancer. There's a med shed. Um, so they're getting the treatment that they need, but at camp, you can just be a kid, all your problems go away. And then even the kids, I saw it so many times, they didn't want to be there, but by the end of the session, they couldn't wait to come back and to go again, and such a special place, and watching that movie for me again, not seeing it since I was a kid myself, and um, and re-watching it yesterday, it brought back all those memories, everything from camp from when I was a kid, when I was a counselor, and uh, just everything, the campfires, the stories, um, uh, everything. So I think that's why it's just so special to to people and why people are watching it every single summer. Does it seem like yesterday? Does it seem like it was that long ago? <laughs> uh, I, I don't believe it. <laughs> it's like a long time ago. It's like a long time ago. Look at us. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But really, time goes by so pa- fast. And, and Ivan, do you look back at your career and think, wow, what a career that you have had? Amazing, and you must be so proud of your kids. Yes, uh, both, uh, um, well, all three of them, but one of them was not interested in show business. But uh, <laughs> J- I mean, uh, Jason um, has has made these wonderful films, and um, like Juno went up in the air, and mm-hmm. I think he, um, I couldn't believe it. he came to me one day and said, you know, I have this idea for a Ghostbuster sequel that I think will really work, and he and a friend of his, uh, Gil Keenan, also a very good writer and director, uh, wrote that draft of what is now called Ghostbusters Afterlife. And um, we've been dying to show this movie. It's really, really good. Oh, uh, my God. I can't wait. I cannot so, wait for this movie. It's been so frustrating for him, A, having to yeah. work with his dad on a movie that oh. his dad made famous. But more importantly, he realized he did something special. And... Um, and we've had to wait, oh, you know, a year and a half. Uh, we were supposed to originally show it in June a, a year ago. And um, now we're coming out in November, God willing. I'm knocking wood right here. And uh, yeah. Catherine, Catherine, you know, is a few years younger. She, And it's thanks to Toronto, actually, that she she was able to get working moms uh, um, on the air. Uh, first at the CBC and and now on Netflix as well. So I think they're going to... Everyone loves it, yeah. So... Uh, Unbelievable. And she's a really good writer as well, and I think uh, they're great. The third one... third one has a very happy life. Uh, she, <laughs> she started as a nurse and this, now has had children and uh, a child. And she, she said, you know, I'm not into show business. <laughs> <laughs> you're like you're smart. Like her. <laughs> That's a good life. What did you say? You said she was happy. Yes, <laughs> she's happy. No, you must be very proud. And uh, and you're right. We can't we can't wait for Afterlife. It's going to be incredible. It looks incredible. Um, but I want to thank all of you, um, Kate, Jack, 
Ivan for doing this. Um, I, it's, this has been a really special night. Uh, I'll drink the wine now. I've, I've been drinking water. Now I think I'll pour myself a <laughs> glass of wine, but we're almost, it's a little later here in Toronto than it is in California. Yes. Um, we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to say a big thank you uh, to Ivan Reitman, Kate Lynch, and Jack Bloom for speaking with us about the film Meatballs. And thanks to all of you for joining us and uh, asking questions. Thank you to the Oakville Festivals of Film and Art for promoting and organizing this event with us. And finally, a huge thank you to everyone watching at home. Um, you know, it's amazing that we are just making it work. You know, we're not having live events right now. It's it's a hard time for everyone. But look at what we're doing tonight and what we're continuing to do um, online. We, we are making this work around the world. So if you like tonight's event, don't forget to post about it on social media uh, using the hashtag can film day and if you want to watch more free canadian movies tonight or tomorrow just head to canadianfilmday.ca to see everything that's available so thanks again have a great night everyone thank you bye-bye everybody bye-bye bye.